Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Tuberculosis, or TB, is one of the world's deadliest diseases, believe it or not. In fact, one quarter of the world's population is infected with TB. Hard to believe. Mm -hmm. Over one million people worldwide die of TB every year. And TB is a leading killer of people who are infected with HIV, the virus that causes AIDS. Amazing statistic. Yeah, fortunately, TB is not all that common in the U.S., but there are still close to 10,000 cases reported each year in this country. What causes it and how is it spread and who's at risk? Joining us in studio to talk about TB is Mayo Clinic Infectious Disease Specialist, Dr. Priya Sampath Kumar. Welcome back to the program. We haven't seen you for a while. Thank you. Thank you for having me back. Dr. Sampath Kumar, good to see you. You know, as I was writing this intro, I said 10,000 cases. Isn't it 100,000 cases in the United States? No, it's somewhere between 9 and 10,000 cases each year. All right, still a lot and not nearly as common here as in the rest of, of the world. But these statistics are pretty staggering that one quarter of the people in the world are infected with TB. How? how why? So uh, TB can spread fairly easily in areas where you are living in close quarters with other people. So the uh, bacteria that causes TB is breathed into the air. And many people with TB live and work in situations where they are very close to other people. They are living in poorly ventilated situations. So TB passes from one person to the other. And when you're infected with TB, you may not know that you're infected. TB can persist in your body for many, many years, and you may not have symptoms until much later in life. So these people living with TB may not know they have TB at all. So your immune system sort of keeps it suppressed? It keeps it suppressed, and you develop what's called latent TB, where you have the bacteria in your body but no symptoms. And then if there's anything that stresses your body, another kind of infection, infection with HIV, for instance, or treatment with steroids, treatment with cancer medications, that allows the TB bug to reactivate and give you uh, what we call TB disease. I just heard a story about... um, uh, TB in the world over the weekend. It was just a long form piece about how is the, is the rates of TB worldwide on the rise? Is, is there something that is concerning worldwide health? Actually, overall, TB is declining in the world. It decreases by about 2% every year, but that's still not fast enough because the world's population is growing. And so the t- number of TB cases are kind of uh, stable across the world. What's happening with TB is that um, the bug is becoming more resistant and we're all living in fear that one day we won't have medications to really treat TB effectively. So we know that there was a significant increase in the number of people with TB in the mid-1980s because of HIV and is that HIV weakens the immune system, is that correct? Correct. And that's how TB, latent TB became active TB. Right. So during the 80s, when uh, HIV started, cases of HIV started appearing, many of the cases were happening in the prison system where there were also people with TB living. And so these we didn't have good medications against HIV at that time. So their immune system became progressively more and more uh, weakened. And these people developed TB, the TB advanced very rapidly, and it spread very uh, fast in prison systems, in healthcare institutions where these people were taken for care. And a lot of um, healthcare workers actually came down with TB during that time. Really, a TB is not all that contagious as compared to, let's say, measles. But if you're in close contact in an environment where the the air is sort of stale, then it's easier to get it? Yes. So there are several different forms of TB. Some forms of TB are actually not infectious at all. So TB can pretty much attack every organ system in your body. It can go to the liver, it can go to the um, kidneys, it can go to the uterus, it can go anywhere. And most of those forms of TB are not infectious. It's when TB is in the lungs that you can breathe the bacteria out, and that's really the only form of TB that is infectious in the mo- for the most part. Um, and certain people are more infectious than others. So people whose immune systems are compromised, people who have um, large uh, lung lesions, a lot of involvement with TB in the lungs. They're more infectious than others. But you're right, it's not as infectious as, say, measles or even influenza. When uh, what most of us Americans know about TB is that you are asked this question all the time and 
you just go, ah, no, 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 no TB at all. And if you're not quite sure or something, they'll do a, a scrape test on your on your arm, and then that's it. That's all you need to know about it. But you said you can go and be undiagnosed because TB can just live in your body. Even if it's in your lungs, does it just live there? or is It could just. So generally, TB enters your body through the lungs. You breathe it in, and then from the lungs, it disseminates through your blood to other organ systems. And it typically becomes dormant in one of these organ systems. So it could become quiet in your lungs. It could just be a tiny nodule on it that shows up on an X-ray. Um, and um, and then it can reactivate, and it can reactivate anywhere. Typically, so, wherever it became dormant is where it first reactivates. If you have TB, then do you have it for the rest of your life? Will you always test positive for it, or can you clear that? So uh, when we do the TB skin test, what we're looking for is TB infection, which means you have the bacteria in your body, but you may or may not have disease. So when the test is positive, it means you have the bacteria in your body. And then we do a series of tests to we ask you questions about your symptoms to determine whether you have TB disease or actual what we think of, what the layperson thinks of as actual TB. So there's a continuum between that latent TB to TB disease. Once you have the skin test positive, it means you've been exposed to the TB bacteria, you do stay positive pretty much for life. Under rare situations, you can lose that positivity. What you're testing for is immunity to TB. And so as your immune system becomes weaker, you can actually lose that positive TB skin test. And what do you do to confirm the diagnosis if the skin test is positive? Is there a blood so test for TB? TB? There is a blood test for TB. So the skin test looks for, uh, and the blood test, both look for the same things. The blood test is a little bit more specific. So with the um, uh, skin test, it, catch, it casts a fairly wide net, and infections with certain bacteria that are related to TB but not TB can result in the uh, skin test being positive. So then we look at the person's uh, exposure history. Have they lived or worked in places where they could have been exposed to TB? If there's absolutely no indication that they've had that exposure, then we might try to do the blood test to see whether or not this was really TB or one of those other bacteria that acted like TB f with regards to the skin test. What if you're in the U.S. and you have a positive skin test? Then what happens to your life? I mean, do you have to go into seclusion for the rest of your life or what happens? No, no, that's a very common misconception. So the positive skin test just indicates that you have been exposed to TB and you may have the TB in your uh, system. So the next thing is to, to talk to you about your exposure, et cetera, and then uh, do some tests to see whether you're infectious to others, because that's what we're most worried about. Will you pass it on to others? Do you need to be in seclusion? So if you have no uh, symptoms at all of TB, the next step would be to get a chest x-ray just to make sure that you're not having TB in the lungs, therefore the infectious form. If the chest x-ray is negative, then depending on the situation, we might do other tests. Uh, to look for TB in other organs, but that is less urgent because you're not infectious. So the it, ruling out infectious TB is the next thing we do when we find out you have a positive skin test. And what about symptoms? If you do have uh, TB involving the lungs, what, cough, I would assume? Yes, typically people have cough. Uh, they may have uh, sometimes cough up a little bit of blood in their um, uh, sputum, when especially early morning. Uh, they also might have just generalized symptoms of TB, which can be uh, nonspecific weight loss, tiredness, lack of appetite. So, you know, in the Middle Ages, before we knew what caused TB, TB was called the white plague because people People became very pale, they had no energy, it was called things like consumption, and at that time all we could do was put people in sanatoriums yeah, yeah. and, you know, fresh air, good food, those were the treatments for TB. Would you survive that or would you just go to the sanitarium to die? So it was kind of a double-edged sword. So you would go to the sanitariums. Everyone else there had TB. Um, so you could pick up another strain of TB. But for some people, if, you know, the reason they had TB was because they were had poor nutrition, improving nutrition immune, improves your immune system. So that could actually work. And so some people did survive, although the survival rate was nowhere near as good as now. 
All right, infectious disease specialist Dr. Priya Sampath Kumar on the topic of tuberculosis, a disease that kills over 1 million people every year worldwide. Time for a short break. When we come back, we'll continue to talk to talk about TB, including the treatment, uh, complications, and what we do know about prevention. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. We are with infectious disease specialist, Dr. Priya Sampath Kumar. Our topic is tuberculosis, a disease that's fairly common worldwide. Fortunately, not so common in the United States. We've talked about the cause. We've talked about the uh, symptoms. We've talked about how the disease is spread. And before we talk about treatment, I want to ask you, we did talk uh, a little bit about risk factors, and the one we mentioned was people with HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, because the virus weakened your immune system. Who else is at risk for tuberculosis? So anyone who has problems with their immune system, and that actually includes people at the extremes of age. So very young children and the elderly are also at risk for TB uh, because their immune systems in the children, in the case of children isn't developed as well, and in older people it has been weakened with age. The other group is people who are receiving uh, steroids. We use steroids for a number of different mm. situations um, like rheumatoid arthritis, um, other what we call autoimmune diseases. Uh, people who are getting cancer chemotherapy, uh, that weakens your immune system. And then um, uh, people who have organ transplants, they also get immunosuppressed to protect the oh. organs. Sure. Yeah, weakens your immune system, so you're set up for TB. But well, it doesn't happen very often. Right. No. I'm always asked, you know, you're asked, have you traveled recently outside of the country? So, like you said, um, it's a greater problem in other parts of the world. If you travel to those other parts, then should you go and get tested when you come back from your travels? So it really depends on what you're doing in the places you travel to. So if you travel to a country that has high rates of TB uh, and you were a tourist, it's very unlikely that you would come back with TB. If you went to provide health care in another country you and you were there for more than two weeks, yes, you should get uh, tested. But, you know, being a tourist, going to look at go sightseeing in other countries, it's very unlikely that you would acquire TB. So I love traveling. I don't want to discourage anyone from traveling. <laughs> is, is there anything you should do before you go to one of those countries? With regards to TB or yeah, just in with general? with regard to TB. No, really. Uh, if you're going there as a tourist, you don't have to worry. Um, All right, let's talk about treatment. Um, because I assume that when these people went were... Uh, to the sanatoriums, there was no treatment. We didn't have antibiotics, but now we do. Yes, yeah, so TB is definitely treatable. TB is actually curable. You will come out um, on the other side eventually. It's just that it takes a long time to treat. So even for very drug-sensitive TB, we need to treat with about uh, initially with four drugs and then um, uh, four with three drugs after the first two months. And typically, treatment is at least six months. Some people, depending on what part of the body the t TB affects, might lead, need longer treatments than that. And these four drugs come as multiple pills so you could end up taking you know up to 12 pills a day um, they're safe but they do have side effects a lot of people have nausea they don't want to take these pills and just taking something for such an extended period of time is difficult so in many parts of the world this is why drug resistance is increasing because people stop taking it once you start taking your meds you feel better in about a month and then you think you're cured and you stop taking it, and that leads to drug resistance. In the US, anyone who's diagnosed with TB actually gets something called DOT, or directly observed therapy, because we're so concerned about people stopping their meds. We have um, public health workers who will go out, deliver your meds to you daily, or have you come to the health department and take it under supervision. And watch you take them. Yeah, I was, uh, we were having a conversation over coffee, as you do. You know, you talk about tuberculosis with your friends. And that's what they said. <laughs> what kind of friends? Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, friends who know people who come to Mayo Clinic from all around the world, really. And so that's what they were saying, is that they had to take these antibiotics and they had to be observed taking the antibiotics. So. Um, it, it's, it's no joke, and you don't want to have drug-resistant tuberculosis. Right, and you can tell them. You can see, for those of us who are, who, those who are watching us on, on YouTube, you see why we called it the red snapper in <laughs> right. medical school. You see that. So why is this bacteria so hard to kill? 
for S- antibiotics. Uh, yes. So the bacteria is very, very slow growing, and different drugs act at different points in its life cycle. So you might uh, kill one population of bacteria that is that is in one phase of its life cycle with one of the drugs, and then there's a population. There's so many of these bacteria in your system. There's another sort of population that's just hanging out and watching the destruction, and and then it watching their buddies. Work. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and then they uh, flourish during that time, and then you need another drug. So giving all four drugs, we're catching the bugs at all different stages in their life cycle and hopefully eliminating the entire population. And what happens if you don't treat it? So if you don't treat TB, if you have TB infection, uh, some proportion of these people will go on to just have the positive skin test, never have any symptoms. Some people will go on to develop active TB. And those and and there is a step in between from when you have the latent TB to active TB where you can actually intervene. And that's your best chance at preventing TB in the future. So if you give these people with latent TB one medication for six to nine months, you can keep them, lower their chances by more than 90% of ever having active TB. That's why doing the skin tests at early on in the disease and treating these people will significantly reduce the burden of TB worldwide. Is there a TB vaccination? There is a TB vaccination. It isn't very good at preventing TB. It is good at preventing um, a TB that involves the brain. So it is given to people in developing countries at birth. Um, or within the first year, and that's to prevent what we call TB meningitis, which is TB involving the brain. Uh, Because as you said earlier, it can be anywhere in the body. Right. It isn't very good at preventing other forms of TB, but it does reduce deaths. And as I said, children are susceptible to TB, so it reduces deaths, brain damage, developmental delays in these children. How much uh, research is being done on tuberculosis? Are you aware of what we can expect in tuberculosis treatment going forward? So we're actually in a really exciting era. So we now have tests that make diagnosing TB easier. So active TB, it used to take six to eight weeks for the bacteria to grow in cultures. I told you it was very slow Mm -hmm. growing. Now we have tests where routine cultures can pick it up within two weeks. So the time to diagnosis of active TB has been reduced. We also have rapid tests, um, molecular tests that can um, actually make the diagnosis of TB, not TB, within a few days. And we also have tests that look for markers for resistance, so we can figure out whether the TB drugs we generally use are going to work or not within a few days. So all of these, in the terms of diagnosis, uh, have been uh, fantastic um, advancements in the past few years. Uh, There has not been as much progress in research in terms of finding out new drugs for TB. In the last 40 years, actually, there have been only three new drugs approved. Mm -hmm. But this year, um, we have a brand new drug that received FDA approval for treatment of drug-resistant TB. So if you think treating TB is hard, treating drug-resistant TB is even harder because it's usually uh, 24 months of treatment or longer. A lot of the treatment is intravenous, so it's not as easy as just taking a pill. This new drug, uh, they hope, will revolutionize uh, treatment of multidrug-resistant TB uh, with just oral medications in six months. So that vaccine that they give to children in developing countries is called BCG still? It's called BCG. And then I assume someone somewhere is working on a vaccine uh, for everyone and for adults. Yes, and there hasn't been a lot of progress in that arena. Um, um, Something for you to work on next yeah. week, huh? Yeah. <laughs> next week. <laughs> Tuberculosis is still one of the deadliest diseases in the world. TB infections began increasing in the mid-1980s because of the HIV virus, which weakens the immune system. And I believe I heard you say, maybe it was before the program, that TB is the commonest cause of infertility in developing countries. That's because it can go to virtually any organ. Right, so it goes goes to the uterus, scars the uterus, uh, causes blockages in the fallopian tubes, and people aren't able to conceive because of that. Wow, relatively rare in the United States, fortunately, but you are at increased risk if you have a weakened immune system. TB, very treatable with antibiotics, but it requires several months of treatment, number one, to get rid of the disease, and number two, to prevent the development of drug resistant TB. Our thanks to infectious disease expert, 
and TB specialist, no, infectious disease specialist and TB expert, Dr. <laughs> Priya Sampath Kumar. Dr. Sampath Kumar, thanks for being with us. You're very welcome.